we acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spirit, imagination and rich history of storytelling and humour that is an inspiration for all Australians. Hello, yes, I know, it's been a hot minute, but I am back. I am back with the only news program to have full support from the Chief Health Officer for all people under and over 50. So it is two full doses for as many weeks apart as I can find the time to write them, then film them, then edit them, then throw out a whole outdated script and start over again. I am Matt Harvey, and we are back out of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Even that reference is out of date, but it's uh, the last major thing that I did. Thanks to all those who came and supported the show. I really appreciate your time. And to those of you who didn't well, I mean, there's far too many of you to make any sort of credible threat. But you know who you are, and all of your parents are extremely disappointed. Yes, I am Matt Harvey, and I will once again be the bearer of weird news. So let's get into the headlines first. The new EU right to repair laws require technology to last for at least a decade. I wanted to celebrate this as a win, but it just means that the robot who will inevitably take my job will have at least 10 years more job security than I will. It's a sad state of affairs, guys. Brazil asks women to delay pregnancy until a better time. As men across Brazil celebrate their collective reprieve, grandmothers in waiting are rallying to storm the parliament with signs that read, stop stealing my grandkids and the much better, she's not getting any younger, you know. It's a sad state of affairs, really. A group of ultra-conservative House Republicans, including Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, are discussing launching an America First caucus that would protect Anglo-Saxon political traditions. Those traditions include breaking up the Roman Empire, dividing Europe, and fighting the Vikings. So watch out EU and Scandinavia, you've been put on notice. I mean, it's just white on white violence. You hate to see it really. It's breaking my heart. Speaking of white, last October, scientists announced the creation of an ultra-white paint so reflective that it could be used to keep surfaces and even entire buildings cool. Well, now they've produced an even whiter paint. When you heard about this breakthrough, Marjorie Taylor Greene was very interested. Whiter than ultra white, you say? Hmm, I may know a group that is particularly interested. That breakthrough was developed as a new way of fighting global warming. The ultra white paints are considered the opposite of the Vanta Black, which absorbs 99.9% .9 of light. They reflect so much light that a surface painted with them actually ends up being cooler than the ambient temperature around them. Redheads are being prematurely warned to avoid standing near the buildings lest they burst into flames like the human torch. I will tell you, we don't do well in the sun. It is very complicated when you live in this country. Now, according to CNN, reporting and an analysis of data from the Gun Violence Archive, local media and police reports, the US has had at least 45 mass shootings in the last month. And conservatives were worried that the pandemic would grind the country to a halt. Nothing stops America, baby! Woo! Back to being number one. Hmm, bizarre. A new super Earth has been detected orbiting a red dwarf star. Woo! We did it, Earth! Yeah, we did it! We found Krypton! Finally! Now, all we need to do is uh, create a 
baby exchange program. And we can get a bunch of supermen flying back and forth. I feel like it's the only chance we've got left, really, at this point. Somebody needs to take charge. A man who wants to have a free government on Mars and insisted on workers working during the coronavirus, who sank his stock prices with a tweet and insisted on inserting himself in saving a bunch of Thai soccer playing boys despite literally everyone, probably even the boys, telling him not to, Elon Musk insists that he won't allow cars to be used as spies because his company's reputation would be ruined. I mean, if you want to save your company's reputation, Musk, maybe make sure it's not your company anymore. ASIO boss, Mike Burgess, said the agency is ditching the Islamic terrorist tag and will now refer to either religious or ideological violence. The Director General said since speaking about the rising threat of far-right extremists last year, ideological extremism investigations had grown from 30 to 40% of the agency's counterterrorism caseload. And ASIO's language needed to accommodate those new groups that fall outside these traditional categories. Those traditional categories being brown and not white. And also brown. Deputy Prime Minister Michael McCormick promotes uh, migration to the regions. His big selling point for the regions? You could live like a king or queen in regional Australia with, you know, five bedrooms, three bathrooms, three car garage, huge backyard, and all those things at a fraction of the price that you could living in a boxed apartment in a terraced house or whatever in Melbourne or Sydney. Clearly, he doesn't realise what kings and queens do. They sit around sponging money from the public purse living a life of unimagined wealth while not working. Probably sit around playing Xbox too. Fucking bludgers. He would hate them. He would hate them. I don't know why he's pushing this monarchist nonsense. US President Joe Biden has backed a filibuster rule change that has Mitch McConnell warning of a scorched earth battle. In a Senate speech, grumpy old man Mitch warbled. Nobody serving in this chamber can even begin, can even begin to imagine what a completely scorched earth Senate would look like. But you can read all about it in McConnell's upcoming book, Oh, the Things You Can Obstruct. I mean, no wonder the Republicans were so scared of cancelling Dr. Seuss. Ted Cruz had planned to read the entire collection while trying to subvert democracy this year. Now he'll never finish his bucket list. Sad state of affairs. Moving on now to not so evil tech company news. A company in a slow race to be the first real company to do a Skynet, Google, is desperately trying to save face after recently firing two of the most prominent AI ethicists in the field. Leaked audio from an internal Google meeting acquired by Reuters reveals that the company's scrambling to turn things around and restore its reputation as a leader of responsible AI development. Well, it is fair to say that they are definitely leading the field in one very specific element. Firing AI ethicists. Someone had to be the number one, and it is a title worth fighting for. Google fired Timnit Gebru, formerly one of the leaders of its AI ethics team, after she raised concerns about Google censoring and altering its own researchers' work to make the company look better, while also trying to scrub conversations about racial inequity within the company. Doing Timnit the ultimate favour of no longer having to juggle their ethical concerns against their conscience and eternal soul. Providing a concise letter of dismissal that simply read, There! Now it's no longer your problem! Happy? 
Months later, Google fired ethical AI co-leader Margaret Mitchell, who has spoken up about Gebru's firings and the same issues that Gebru had, and further committed the unethical act of plagiarism, as they provided Margaret with the exact same letter as Timnit, though remembering to change the name at the top of the letter so they wouldn't be caught out entirely. They are unethical, not stupid. Moving on now to French espionage news. IKEA's French subsidiary and several of its executives are set to go on trial over accusations that they illegally spied on employees and customers, and more specifically, trapping people in an endless rat-like maze where they're continuously tempted to give up and just stay forever by the building of very inviting homesteads within the maze to confuse and overwhelm the shoppers, thinking maybe that they live here now and they'll just stay. Trade unions reported the furniture and home goods company to French authorities back in 2012, accusing it of collecting personal data by fraudulent means and the illicit disclosure of personal information when they should be stealing customers' information by the more accepted means of tricking them into using a free service, harvesting their information like delicious grapes off a free vine in the middle of a public park that sprung up overnight and has a giant neon sign that reads, free grapes here, nothing suspicious, just uh, go on and grab some free grapes. You know, the more traditional method. The unions specifically alleged IKEA France had paid to gain access to police files that contained information about targeted individuals, which begs the question, who were they reporting the information to? Firefighters? The army? Or did they run home and tell mummy? Not gonna lie, I'm very disappointed, Inspector Clouseau. All your bumbling antics can't distract us from the fact that you're on the take under the pay of big build-it-yourself furniture. Very disappointing. The victims claim that IKEA France managers used surveillance to target union leaders along with conducting criminal and background checks on unsuspecting employees, job candidates, and even customers seeking large refunds because people trying to return a bookshelf deserve everything that is coming their way. You can't just shove a body in a bookshelf, nail it shut, and call the extra wood. What? It's bonus wood, which you should be appreciative to get. Now stop asking questions and take the shelf. Much of this work was allegedly outsourced to a former French military operative based in Africa, who in some instances employed contacts to don disguises or false identities to collect information. And this is a movie I want to see. Vin Diesel, The Rock and Jason Statham all don bad French accents and form a unit of ex-legionnaires who, now out of work, have to find a new and much less exciting way to pay their bills, all while exploring the existential dread of putting ex-servicemen to work in a world that condemns the very work that they were trained to do. It's very French. The critics are gonna love it. It's Oscar bait for everybody. Moving on to AI learning all the wrong lesson news. Researchers have changed the game of digital monopoly to help artificial intelligence adapt to unexpected events. Oh, great. So, there is inevitably going to be a group of young, impressionable AI who were exposed to the game at a vulnerable and life-defining age as they learn the wrong lessons from the anti-capitalist turned capitalist orgy game about running up the rent on all your properties to the point where you bankrupt your opponents and are celebrated as though you did something good. Fantastic. So what's the big change? Well, the big change here was they charge the players a wealth tax every time a player passes go instead of 
giving them $200, much more accurately reflecting the experience of living life in the world, but also filling them with the false expectation that it will be the wealthy who are getting taxed rather than the downtrodden. Typical. Experiments like this could improve the function of AI in wider scale real life situations, such as the complex assessment of whether someone should be approved for a credit card. So we're going to be teaching AI, raised on the mean streets of Old Kent Road and Whitechapel Road, to make the life changing, and some would argue life destroying, decision of giving people who need money credit cards. Very cool. The only upside, I guess, will be that this AI will have actually spent some time in prison and might actually be able to empathize with someone who needs a second chance. Apparently, AI agents need the ability to detect, characterize, and adapt to novelty in human-like ways. So I guess we'll be filming it and putting it on the internet for other humans and robots to interact with so it too can receive those good brain chemicals as the other humans and humanoid robots interact with their discovered novelty. Maybe sharing it with a friend, maybe liking it, maybe placing a comment, maybe donating some money or going to its live show. Who knows? Who knows what way these uh, AI might enjoy your interactions or the interactions of other robots. And you could do it again and again until the novelty starts to lose itself as a novelty. But who knows? You come back to it a little bit later on and you remember why you enjoyed it in the first place and then you start to like and comment and interact and show up to its live shows once again. You know, the standard run. Some breaking ethical news. What's that? Google. Oh, hey, Google. Welcome back. Google has unsurprisingly found itself in further ethical trouble in Australia's federal court, being found that the company had misled Android users about the location data collected through their mobile devices. Google argued that if a consumer disabled the location history setting on their device but left the web app activity on, then it would have continued to collect, store, and use their personally identifiable location data, stating that, hey, it's not our fault that our vaguely defined functions can't be interpreted by your idiot customers. It's not like our entire business model is built on the illegal harvesting of consumer information from a database of users who were unknowingly allowing us to profit off their ignorance. Jeez, we can't be expected to think of everything. This is why Google needs unethical robots in its employ. It needs to be able to pass the buck onto its robot workforce who is working on a much more complicated level of ethics which totally justifies killing a few dozen people in order to maintain a degree of control over the majority. Guys, it's 9D chess. Come on! Closing the border news now! Federal Treasurer and guy who just has a lot going on in this photo. Have a look at this. So there's guy showing more leg than this chair. There's also guy who insists on leaving the label out so that you know the vintage of his drink. Or guy who starts every Monday telling you where he rode his garish bike during the weekend. And guy desperately trying to get the magic of a Dorian Gray picture happening, not just for himself, but for Australia's fossil fuel industry and Australia's debt, Josh Frydenberg. Josh has defended the drastic choice to enforce a travel ban on Australians attempting to enter Australia from India by threatening to jail those who fly home. As much as I don't agree with Frydenberg's hot take of people that we left in COVID-stricken countries for months on end are now risking us with even more COVID, it's just good to see a political party do what it said that it would do. In this case, make sure the borders are closed to everyone, even Australians. I mean, if you love Australia so much, why did you leave? Visiting family? Nope. Should have smuggled them into the country, seeing as you love it so much here. The only 
thing that leaves Australia is what we dig out of it and our small plastic manufacturing, especially since China stopped taking our garbage, it doesn't leave the country anymore. It's actually the best time for us to shut our borders because the Aussie cricketers, Adam Zampa and Kane Richardson, have already managed to return to Australia from the Indian Premier League, despite the country's ban on flights from India. No surprise there. So what's going on here? I thought our border security was airtight. It was good enough to catch these pigeons smuggled in this guy's pants. How did you not find two humans? I mean, to be fair, those pigeons have never played sport for Australia, so the law does actually still apply to them. So the cricketers, they touch down in Melbourne via a commercial flight from Qatar, sparking concerns they'd exposed a loophole in Prime Minister Scott Morrison's travel ban. That loophole being having enough money to be able to afford more than one flight. Which most Australians stuck overseas can't actually do because they've been struggling to work, to afford food, or to be able to lock in a single flight that isn't a first class flight. And now, some of our cricketers are safely in, we can close that loophole and make it a crime for citizens to return from COVID ravaged countries. Harkening back to the oldest tradition of colonial Australia, you need to be a criminal to get in. We've also got fines up for grabs as well as possibly five years in prison. We are looking at as much as $66,600. What's that? 666? Well, now I can really see Morrison's Hillsong influence coming out. I expect in order to deter people from entering the country and save money on hotel quarantine, we'll just go straight to crucifying return travellers, then locking them in a cave. If they reappear three days later, it'll be a miracle! And we can accept them in the country. Disappearing, reappearing RoboDebt news! RoboDebt, the true line villain that, like Jason, just won't die, is back. But instead of fighting Freddy or going to space, it is taking up a brand new terrible habit. Magic! As it works on its newest and most awful trick, the so-called vanishing Centrelink debts, giving welfare recipients false hope and causing confusion and distress. For those fortunate enough to not be in the know, we robo-debtors have exclusive VIP, very indentured person, access to a page very subtly called Money You Owe, and in parenthesis, just the word cunt, just to rub it in a little bit. Under the social security scheme, overpayment debts can happen because people did not declare their income correctly. Uh, because they were not eligible for money that they received or because the government illegally seized money from them in unlawful debts. There's just so many options available to the Australian people. Now, Busybody Helper Group Not My Debt, which helps people challenge welfare overpayments, has reported that some people had recently seen their debts disappear, like they were a tax debt and that they were a one percenter. I mean, it's a delightful and tragic taste of a life that they will never know, where they're not held accountable for financial decisions, be they yours or the government's. One person who contacted The Guardian said that they had been battling their debt since 2017, and like the Statue of Liberty under the watchful camera of David Copperfield, it had now disappeared. They later learned, like everything else in 2020, it had simply been quarantine. And while nobody quite knows what that even means, it is most likely, like the Statue of Liberty in a David Copperfield special, it had actually not disappeared at all. The problem had merely been moved, so the view had been changed. And Service Australia did not rule out that the debts would return to people's accounts. Like a post credit scene in a Marvel film. You'll spend all the time sitting around waiting for more information, only to be greeted by Captain America lecturing you on the virtues of patience. Independent Senator Rex Patrick said, It's hugely disrespectful for Services Australia to change the status of someone's debt. 
particularly when the change may give people false hope that their debts are cleared, only to find out later that this is not the case. Like in 2016, when we thought that we had seen the last of David Blaine, only for him to release two specials in 2020, as if we hadn't suffered enough. Rex said, Robodet has caused considerable stress and harm among the most vulnerable in our community. Robodet recipients need to be kept informed and treated with empathy and respect. No word yet on when Jenny Morrison will be deployed on her great empathy tour, travelling from Centrelink to Centrelink, asking, what if your child was called Centrelink? What if your child had a robo-debt? Simultaneously blowing their minds and opening their hearts to the possibility that other humans are in fact humans. Amazing. That woman knows no end to her empathy. Not My Debt said that it had assisted some recipients to obtain what is known as a statement of debt. The most depressing piece of paper since that time, The Rock learned who could defeat it in rock, paper, scissors. Paper? Paper? How am I defeated by paper? I'm a rock! These statements showed that their disappearing debts had been quarantined because magic isn't real and stop having dreams and wasting your money on these flights of fancy and pay your damn debts. It's a more infuriating trick than the ink used by Marvin Acme to write his will. <laughs> what, you think that's funny? Oh, it's a panic! <laughs> you won't think it's funny when I stick that pen up your nose. Oh, now calm down, son, will you? Look, the stain's gone. It's disappearing ink. No hard feelings, I hope. The greatest trick the government ever learned is convincing the world that their guilt doesn't exist. On to wage theft news! Provisions criminalizing wage theft, changes to enterprise bargaining, award simplification and extended long-term pay agreements for major projects were thrown out by the Morrison government. The proposed penalties were put forward by Christian Porter before his past came back to appropriately deal him some consequences. These reforms promised criminal penalties of up to four years in prison to crack down on serious wage theft and new civil penalties of two or three times the amount of underpaid wages. So there would actually be appropriately dealt out fines for businesses who stole money. So that's a nice change. But it seems they couldn't face the irony of putting into law penalties for punishing past misdeeds that were proposed by Christian Porter. I mean, come on. The man is trying to avoid his past. The coalition did keep increased rights for casual workers to ask for permanent jobs and a definition of that work type from its original bill. Partly because they are the party of jobs at the moment and not the party of good jobs or jobs that don't steal from you or get punished when they steal from you. Just jobs. Provisions criminalising wage theft, changes to enterprise bargaining, award simplification and extended long-term pay agreements for major projects were thrown out. Because if you try to make a Liberal Party member suffer for his past, then everybody will suffer. Get it? It all rested on former Nick Xenophon team, current Centre Alliance member, and man who gave an impassioned anti-anime speech attempting to ban the importing of anime in Australia and into your quiet housemate's heart, Sterling Griff. Griff held the deciding vote, but would back only the casuals and wage theft provisions. So the government took its bat and ball and screamed, if you can't handle me at my detaining refugees on a prison island, then you don't deserve me out of my helping the poor get money back from the shitty bosses, and gutted the package. Prime Minister Scott Morrison started playing his old classic, blaming the Labour Party for leading 
opposition to the bill despite his government failing to win crossbench support for the measures. No surprises there. Which is a pretty twisted version of them being voted down because they were considered pretty awful overall. Which I can't say is a huge surprise. The Liberal government doesn't actually know how to communicate with people who earn less than $180,000. As they've already expressed, those people aren't even rich. The ACTU opposed the weakening of wage theft punishments in jurisdictions where it was already deemed a criminal act. And the Australian Workers Union said it would only support the new offence if the Victorian and Queensland laws were expressly preserved. Whereas the Victorian Labor government said the bill's focus on the most serious offences was more limited than its current wage theft laws, which can carry up to 10 years jail and are set to come into effect in July. So you better watch out, restaurant industry. You've been put on notice. July is coming for you. JobKeeper is done. It's time to fix your books. And not in like the dodgy way. Fix them so that they're correct, like the actual definition of fixing. Senator Griff said that he was gobsmacked with the government's decision to scrap wage theft penalties. Donning his best angry dad at the picnic voice, he said to Parliament, shame on you all for trashing such an important amendment. And even though I disagree with his anime shaming stance, on this, we agree. Especially because wage theft penalties were supported by all five crossbench senators in a very rare consensus. They formed the very rare Senatorial Voltron. Even One Nation supported the government's package after striking a deal for small changes to rules around converting to casual employment. Whereas independents Jackie Lambie and Rex Patrick had proposed dumping all of the bill except for the wage theft penalties. Look, I can't say that this entirely surprises me, as this is the Liberal government trying to make money from workplaces after the revelations that they will not be forcing any workplace to pay back excess JobKeeper that they may have acquired while making record profits from a pandemic. Who are these profiteering plunderers? Well, let's explore, shall we, in the horrible world of hypocrisy. Let's have a look here. Who have we got here? We have... Here we go. The tax office has revealed 340 million in overpayments made to businesses on JobKeeper. In another scandal around the $101.3 billion wage subsidy program this year. So about $150 million is missing. And while roughly $135 million has been clawed back already, the ATO ruled out chasing down the further $50 million or so because they said businesses had made genuine errors. As opposed to those genuine monsters on JobSeeker who will do whatever it takes to steal their dirty sitting at home and bumming around watching Netflix money. Bunch of filth they are and have never ever made a genuine mistake while dealing with a circular and deceptive bureaucracy of Centrelink and it certainly isn't that the high turnover of undertrained staff will cause problems for these masterminds capable of inflicting Darren Brown levels of deception merely by speaking on the phone. Why does Darren Brown work so hard when he can just pick up the phone and talk to some people for a much more effective special? Darren Brown, the great welfare heist. Really leaning into the magic today. Okay, who have we got? Who have we got? Let's... Let's have a look, who have we got here? First up, Solomon Luz. That's the Just Group, the company behind such brands as Peter Alexander, Smiggle, Just Jeans, Dottie, JJ's. Now, Premier Investments, who actually owns Solomon Luz, 
has been under increasing pressure to repay their JobKeeper subsidies after the company reported a surge in profits over the pandemic. Presumably because people were both putting on those COVID kilos, and so they needed to buy new pants, and had nothing else to do, and so they got really heavily into arts and crafts. But only with like odd shaped highlighters because we were desperate for any sort of novelty. So earlier this year, the company said that it expected its earnings before interest and tax to come at between 221 million and 233 million for the 27 weeks till January 30th, a 75 to 85% rise. Not to mention last year, outgoing chief executive Mark McKines received a $2.5 million bonus. Uh, presumably that is for being the only person who has managed to make a smiggle profitable. Sure, it took a pandemic, but that's just the kind of outside of the box thinking that nets you a $2.5 million bonus, baby! And this one's, a, this one's a bit of an odd one. Footwear retailer Accent Group, the $1.2 billion retailer which operates stores such as Platypus, Hype and Sketches, will not hand back any of its almost $50 million that it received in JobKeeper subsidies, despite reporting a $20 million jump in profits for the first half of the fiscal year 2021. Footwear? Where have you been going? Unless Accent Footwear is the official footwear of uh, anti-lockdown protesters who seem to be the only ones out and about so needing to wear shoes gathering en masse to shout down Dictator Dan and his erosion of your human rights. Have I cracked onto something here? Ooh, this might be worth investigating. Accent Group reported a 52.8 million net profit after tax, up 57% on pre-pandemic levels. Although Chairman David Gordon said, it remains our position that no JobKeeper funds have or will be used in the calculation or payments of management bonuses and dividends. Oh, such a treasure. This is very odd because Shadow Assistant Minister for the Treasury, Andrew Lee, who has been a fierce advocate for the repayment of JobKeeper, criticised Accent's decision, saying the business should repay the subsidy in light of the $1.3 million bonuses given to Chief Executive Daniel Agnostinelli last year. I'm not going to go back and re-record his name. He doesn't deserve it. A company that makes more sense to me that they'd be making bank. Have a look here. Who do we have? Shipping Group Cube Holdings will give back 17 million in JobKeeper subsidies. How did they end up on the horrible world of hypocrisy ride? Well, let me tell you. Strap in, because it's going to make you vomit more than a Scooby-Doo ride. For starters, Cube Holdings paid out the largest executive dividends of any company that received JobKeeper subsidy, some 2.78 million. Right? Now, Michael West Media says that there is little evidence Cube was even eligible for JobKeeper, and as a revenue drop of more than 50% was required to be eligible. However, at the end of June 2020, Cube reported its underlying revenue had increased 9% over the same period in 2019. Say what? I couldn't even get JobKeeper as a sole trader because one of my jobs had already applied for me and despite me not being at that job anymore, I wasn't allowed because I was already in the system and they can't possibly be expected to do the job of setting up some paperwork twice. That wouldn't leave them any time to refuse to discuss how Cube qualified for JobKeeper and that is an extremely important job. Although, there is a whole shipping container of tea being spilled by numerous union officers reporting to Michael West Media that during a bargaining meeting held in Sydney last year, 
that there were threats to shut down seven Australian ports if Cube wasn't awarded the JobKeeper subsidy. If only I had that kind of threatening power. Threats that Scott Morrison publicly condemned at the start of the pandemic. At the time, saying he wouldn't rule out the military intervention to settle the militant and extortionate dispute, claiming falsely that 40 ships were lined up outside Port Botany. Morrison, mate, this isn't the Suez Canal. Where are you getting these numbers from? Then turning to his tired and shrewd, successful negotiating technique, threatening to shoot or blow somebody up if they don't listen to him. Like a good Christian, like Jesus would have done. Despite posting 940 million in revenue in their financial year 21 first half yearly earnings report, Cube is now trying to force 595 wharfies to pay back a portion of their JobKeeper subsidy through unpaid hours if the worker, for whatever reason, did not work their full hours whilst receiving the subsidy. Those reasons include the seasonal nature of wharf work, even in non-pandemic times. Oh, and the pandemic! Some pretty good reasons for not maybe not being able to do your full complement of hours. Cube management argues that its wharfies were given a JobKeeper payment for 80 hours of work in a 28-day period. It remains to be seen how much repayment Cube is seeking, the result of which could allow them to claw back the 17 million in JobKeeper payments that they have just returned to the government. Oh, ding, 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 ding. Employee exploitation? That's our secret word for the day. We, of course, never say the secret word out loud. That's what makes it a secret. But whenever it is alluded to through rat fuckery and sneaky back channel behavior, it still triggers the word of the day alarm. And a story of workplace fuckery within Australia wouldn't be complete without checking in on everyone's old favorite man to hate, Jerry Harvey. What's going on, Jerry? What have you been up to? Seems Harvey Norman has refused to hand back more than 13 million in JobKeeper subsidies despite funneling hundreds of millions of dollars into investors in the past year as their profits have soared. The electronics and furniture retailer boosted after-tax profits by 116.3% to $462 million. Certainly sounds like a struggling business that wouldn't have survived and I can't say this legally, but I know it in my heart. Definitely exploited its workers to shit when the government was footing the bill. You better believe that they were working some crazy hours. Now Jerry Harvey is refusing to repay taxpayers despite reaping a whopping $78 million personal payday. Can you Photoshop your life with better decisions, Jerry? Okay. Jerry has insisted that the government will receive the money back in tax, even though that is a separate legal requirement for all companies, irrespective of whether they took JobKeeper. And that's just wrong, Jerry, which is assuming that you're even paying all the taxes that you're supposed to. Are you, Jerry? Are you paying your taxes? Because the ABC says that you had 410 million taxable dollars on a 1.47 billion dollar profit in 2018. And this equation, like my calculator that lost the plus button, doesn't add up. The New Daily has compiled a list of companies that have failed to repay their job company debts. Let's take a look at that, shall we? Oh, what a list! Only five companies have actually paid that money back. Who? Who are these kings among companies? Well, let's have a look here. The only companies to have paid back their JobKeeper fully are Toyota, 
Iluka Resources, Santos, CMIC, and Abri. Look, maybe Toyota is still trying to dig itself out of the whole preferred vehicle of ISIS thing, and that's why they paid back their JobKeeper, but uh, hey, we'll take it, you know. Give that JobKeeper back, please. Whereas uh, groups that have only paid back some of their JobKeeper, uh, the Super Retail Group, Nick Scarly, Cochlear, Collins Foods, Blackmores, Adairs, Cube, Helios, Ingenia, Nine, Universal Saw, Liners, Rare Earth, Dusk, and these companies in particular, these next two companies, which undoubtedly would have done gangbusters in a period of people not leaving their house and job loss. Domino's and Seek. I spent a good amount of time looking for new jobs while being forced to job seek during a pandemic from a house that I wasn't legally allowed to leave except to go for an hour's worth of run in an attempt to run off the leaning tower of pizza worth of pizza that I ingested during lockdown. But never fear! The first conviction for JobKeeper fraud is here! <laughs> Who is the lucky recipient of all this ATO attention? Let's have a look, see. Oh, of course. A Melbourne man has been found guilty of falsely claiming he was a sole trader in order to receive the coronavirus wage subsidy. Can't say that I'm surprised there. I mean, I'm not mad, I'm just somewhat impressed. I'm a sole trader and I wasn't allowed to get any money for being a sole trader. Every time we lock down, I need to be registered for GST in order to be able to access the grants that were given to cover wages lost during lockdown. So I have gotten next to nothing that wasn't job seeker. I should give this guy a consulting fee and get him to convince the ATO that I'm a business. I might be running at a loss, but I'm still operating. This man was fined $3,000 in order to pay $3,000 in compensation and $282 in costs for three counts of making a false and misleading statement to the ATO. Now this guy lodged two JobKeeper applications that claimed he was a sole trader who experienced a downturn of at least 30% turnover in May and June. However, the Magistrates Court found he was not operating a genuine business and had full-time equivalent employment. I mean, that term, genuine business, is an interesting one. My assessment of what makes a genuine business is definitely one that exists, but there is more. Genuine businesses shouldn't steal wages from their staff. They shouldn't steal revenue, which will build life-saving hospitals from the country, making employees piss in bottles to meet unreasonable quotas, or try to gaslight you from getting workplace compensation, denying you access to a union, thinking that pizza will solve all your workplace concerns, making you wear a shitty uniform because it's fun, or instead of giving you any sort of real assistance, instead form a circle and try taking bets when a customer starts yelling at you and chanting, fight, 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 fight. But that's just me and my experience with business. ATO Deputy Commissioner Will Day supported the conviction, saying the tax office has an important role to ensure JobKeeper payments were paid out in line with the scheme's intended purpose and were not exploited by members of the community. I'm just gonna let that statement hang in the air for a moment while this image of Jerry Harvey bounces around the screen like a screensaver on a DVD player. For young listeners, a DVD is what made lonely people watch hours and hours of audio commentary to learn more about their favourite movies so they could entertain their friends at any program so they could entertain their friends at inappropriate moments with trivia that now both of us have to carry in our heads for the rest of our lives. Oh, 
took five days to shoot that scene, did it? It's a lot of days. More than I would have thought. What are we going to do now? But don't stress. Like everything else, from tax underpayments, the country's growing debt, recycling concerns, and climate change, we can take the onus off making things right from the large companies who love us and our planet. As you can tell by the expensive millions of dollars that they spend on media campaigns to tell us that they are good boys and girls and that I for one am inclined to believe them and we will proceed to place the full responsibility on individuals who didn't have the foresight to make millions of dollars from cost-cutting initiatives in the pockets of their staff in order to prepare a media defence to make the public understand that they couldn't possibly create as much impact as a business if they lived to be 200 or bothering to create a four minute shower song playlist. Yeah, that's gonna save us all. That'll definitely save the planet. Oh really, songs aren't they good? And that way people can feel the real weight of their decision to shower longer today because they spent the entire day elbow deep in compost and rubbish trying to make sure all of their recycling and garbage is sorted correctly on their day off. So you've earned more than four minutes, damn it. You're gonna take that shower, no matter what the song list says. And finally, questionable acquisition news. The publisher of the Daily Mail, Daily Mail and General Trust, has acquired the renowned weekly science and technology magazine New Scientist in a 70 million pound cash deal. The 65 year old title, which was owned by a group of investors led by Sir Bernard Gray, was reassured the magazine's editorial independence, the ruling out of staff cuts, as well as the sharing of editorial content a piece of information I'd like to take at face value. But the Daily Mail has a real reputation for being unreliable. No, that's not it. Ah, oh, um, no, I got it. Yeah, sensationalist unreliable trash. Sorry, sorry again, there. Sensationalist unreliable trash. I always forget to put proper full titles. It's a real mental block of mine. I don't remember. Anyway. The New Scientist was founded in 1956 for all those interested in scientific discovery and its social consequences. Well, nobody's more interested in social consequences than the Daily Mail. Here we see them being keen to invite people to participate in a little social consequences, mostly anger, as they also demonstrate that fine attention to detail as they tell you in no unsensational terms that Joe Biden's climate plan will most definitely, and we certainly research this properly, limit you to one burger a month. Very rigorous science. No, no reason to concern. I'm sure that they are as diligent with their science as they are with their finding the things that will get you the most clicks. They have turned clickbaiting into a real science, if I'm honest fundamentally changing the face of STEM. So, to accommodate this new scientific development, STEM will no longer be STEM, STEM will now be STEAM, adding a fifth academic discipline, science, technology, engineering, antagonism, and mathematics. It does put the previous students of STEM in an awkward position as they attempt to adjust to their new classmates a libel of dodgy news reporters. See, a libel, of course, being the traditional collective noun for bad journalists. Their new classmates will, of course, spread wild rumours about the STEAM, formerly STEM, community, exposing them and all their depravity to the other students to read all about it. The school newspaper has never been more popular, but also never more harmful. This 
is a paper that you would actually believe could actually beat rock. That is how cutting it is. The STEM kids will, however, gain a new sense of self. Seeing themselves as the bad boys of science, they will become what others see them as. Trouble in a lab coat. They will no longer respect the sciences except chemistry as they use their chemical bonds to create and sell drugs to the other kids, further corrupting the school body and only feeding the media machine that is the ever-growing pit of shame, the school newspaper. Alrighty guys, thanks once again for hanging out with me, listening, and uh, hopefully enjoying this episode. Um, once again, thanks to those who came out to see the show, I really appreciate your support and your time, and if you couldn't make it out to the show, uh, I understand things are a bit complicated at the moment with uh, coronavirus, and even though a lot of shows were open, uh, you might not feel safe doing that yet, so no shame, but if you want to come out to a future show, please do so, I uh, don't have anything lined up for a while at this point, but if you uh, might be doing some gigs, uh, starting sometime soon, so look out for local gigs, follow us on Facebook and all that, do all the YouTube things, share this with a friend, if you think someone else might enjoy it and you don't have money to support me financially, best way to support is by sharing this with people, um, do a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to us. Thanks for your time, stay safe, look after yourselves. Continue to wash your hands, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.